Well, it's good to be with you. It's good to have an opportunity to delve into God's Word and, and to uh, spend some time with His Spirit uh, right now. I'd like to add uh, my own prayer as well as I transition uh, in the service to the message. God in heaven, uh, I just continue to dedicate my heart to you, Lord, my thoughts, my words. Uh, Lord, it is uh, such an honor to be able to share your message. I pray that your voice would be the voice that's heard. And Lord, uh, I do pray for those who are traveling for the weekend and for our, our friends and family that are at uh, baccalaureate as well. Uh, may this time be a blessing to them uh, also. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I, uh, I'm going to continue on a, a little bit of a, uh, of a theme or a, uh, a sermon series on this idea of, of delving deeper into our understanding of who Christ is and who we think He is and how the Bible continues to, to delve deeper and reveal uh, the truth and beauty of Jesus Christ. Um, I, and we're doing it through the first few chapters of the Gospel of John. It's not going to go through the entire book. Next week will be uh, the last in the series as we uh, transition to camp meeting Sabbaths and things like that. Um, but I, I think these are relevant. I think these are important um, uh, messages for the time in which we live. And um, did it die? Sometimes, oh, we can leave it there, that's fine. Actually, I do want to go back, if you could. Thank you. Perfect. Um, and, and just to give some context and some some uh, uh, analysis to why this happens to be on my heart. With all the things happening in our, our world right now, wars and, and, and travesty and, and devastation, with everything happening in our country right now, with anti-Semitism and, and, and controversy and politics, you know, you, you, you try to think, well, what is of most relevant to the, the, the Christian individual right now? And I think of how in, in Christ's ministry, how he was often faced with the, you know, similar questions from people trying to draw him in to what probably were uh, secondary issues. He was often pressured. Well, what about Herod? Uh, Herod who mingled uh, the blood of, of worshipers with their sacrifices. And, and what about Pilate? And, and should we pay taxes to Caesar? Uh, and, and what if a person gets married seven times and, and, and then they go to heaven? Who, who are they going to be married to? They're trying to engage Jesus in, in, in uh, things that were of interest to them or things that were of, of, of sim somewhat temporal relevance. And Jesus always had a way of navigating through them uh, to kind of get to the core issue of what his ministry was of, of, look, we just need to make sure we all understand who God is and what our place is in the kingdom of heaven. And, and I think that there's a, a, a challenge when it comes to our, our world today, too. People, you know, they say, oh, I want to hear more about Biden. I want to hear more about Trump. I, I want to hear what the position is on uh, the anti-Semitism and, and all that. And not, not that these are not relevant or important things to be discussed at some level, uh, but I think it is always a good time to reaffirm and reconnect with the more eternal reality of who Jesus Christ our Savior is. And in John 17, um, since I referenced being in the Gospel of John, Jesus has uh, one of those verses that, that just speaks directly to this in John 17, 3. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So of all the issues that are going on, eternal life is what we are pursuing. And knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ is the avenue, is the conduit by which whatever's going on in our country, we can have hope and assurance. Amen? Uh, Philippians 3.10 says, Paul says, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, that I may too attain to the resurrection. He says, of all the things going on, the most key important reality is having a deep assurance that I know who Jesus Christ is. Uh, I think that we, we can recognize, and by the way, this is all part of uh, just getting into the, the, the mindset our country is changing. It is. It is changing. Whoever you vote for, and vote your conscience. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But whether one party wins or the other party and other individual wins, it doesn't really affect the, the reality that the nation that looks like a lamb is going to speak like a dragon. Do you understand? 
And this is one of the great distinctions that the Seventh-day Adventist church contributes to the Christian message in the last days. While most of Christianity believes it's their last day reality to convert the government and convert society, okay, Seventh-day Adventists believe that the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus Christ is to convert the individual because the government and society will not last. And while that may seem like a subtle difference, it, 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 and if, if, if you've never been uh, engaged in, in, in groups outside of the Seventh-day Adventist church, it's enormous. It's enormous. Jesus did not convert the school of the Pharisees. He converted individual Pharisees to the truth. Does that make sense? And so, um, I, I think that as believers in Jesus Christ, we reaffirming this deep reality and conviction of knowing who our Lord is and what He's called us to be and who He is, is deeply important, relevant uh, any day of the week, and uh, I think right now it's a value as well. So, uh, when I did the first sermon in this series, I ended it with that, a really cool uh, sermon that Dr. Lockbridge did of all the different names of Jesus, if you remember it. Um, by the way, his name is Shadrach Meshach Lockbridge, Dr. S.M. Lockbridge, if you're interested in that, uh, pastor of the Calvary Baptist congregation for 40 years. Um, I, need, I need one more because, you know, having one is limiting. Oh, look at all the... Vol- oh, I got Forrest here, Edwin. He beat you to the punch. Thank you so much. So I just have a question for the young people. Tell me any of the names of Jesus that you can think of in the Bible. By the way, the 117, that's just one person's analysis. Uh, There's probably more ways. And these are just hints up there. He's the son of many things. He's the I am, uh, different ways he's referred to as the Savior, the incarnate, second Adam, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I already see some hands. So Isaiah, what is one of the names of Jesus? Son of God. Son of God. Thank you. That is absolutely correct. That's the first one up there. Are there? Hey, Madden's right. Or is Sophia or one of them over here? <laughs> They're shaking their head. No, she said no, Toby, but Madden. And then I see Dylan as well. Madden and then the Messiah. The Messiah. Very good. Dylan over here and then Benji. Okay, you guys, this, this side is winning right now. Okay, Abel's going to help us out too. Rabbi. Rabbi, he was called a teacher. Rabbi, very good. Um, Abel. David. Son of David. Okay, yes, yes. A, B. And. King of Jews. King of the Jews, that's right. See how easy this is? This is wonderful. Son of man. Son of man, that's the M. Eric? The word. The word. Man, these guys are knocking it out of the park. Isaiah, we'll do a couple more, just a couple more. Son of Abraham. Son of Abraham. Boy, you guys are going to knock out that top line going right here. This is wonderful. All right, Kyle. The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan? He is good. Yeah, sure, we'll give it to you. (laughs) Maybe. One, one or two more? All right, are we done? Okay. Natalia? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, awesome. All right, Isaiah started us, and Isaiah's going to finish us, all right? Uh, I didn't catch that. The Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. I think that was the good S that you were thinking of, Kyle. Hey, thank you, Forrest. Thank you, Toby. So again, you know, and it's really one of those things, you can't even limit it to, you can just set it on the pew, there's fine. Um, You can't even limit it because God is the creator of all things. He identifies himself. He is the mountain of salvation, right? Uh, he, 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 he's an eagle. He's, uh, you know, he's even the serpent uh, because he takes on the sins of the world. So there's almost no limit. That's why even when Kyle said the good Samaritan, is he the good Samaritan? Yes. Is he the person that would be unexpected to do something good, but he did? I think that we can give him credit for that. And um, so there's really no limit, but the, the ones that I put up here are hints, the Son of God, man, David, Abraham, the I am. There's at least 40 I am's that Jesus is. Uh, you know, he's the light, he's the bread, the good shepherd, he's the door, he's the priest, he's the king, 
Um, he's the prophet. I am. Uh, even just the I am. Different words for Savior, Redeemer, Ransom, Lamb of God. The incarnate Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, the Word that became flesh. He became our friend when He took on humanity as well. And then the Isaiah 9-6 list, these are some of my favorite that go back from the Old Testament. And His name, clearly referencing Christ, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of peace. By the way, one of the best Trinitarian verses in the Bible is right here in Isaiah 9, 6, because it's clearly referencing Jesus, but it calls Him the Counselor, which is also a name for the Holy Spirit. It calls Him the Father, and it calls Him the Prince of Peace, all in one title. So, this is one of those powerful that, that God is one, and the Son is the same as one, and the Spirit are all one, although He identifies as three as well. So, lots of ways that God reveals His character and His name to us. Now, uh, just another little uh, uh, intro into uh, in analyzing the gospel of John and understanding its place. Uh, when I uh, started this series a few weeks ago, I talked about how each of the gospels offers a unique perspective on the story of Jesus, and we understand that. And even though uh, they don't always agree, I'm not saying there's contradictions, but there are challenges and sometimes understanding how different uh, reflections or different views of Jesus are presented in each of the Gospels. Those are worthy uh, things that we can analyze together. Mark is generally recognized as being the first Gospel written. Uh, most scholars, most historians will say Mark was probably written first, right around 50 AD. And Mark's tone and his way of presenting is largely like someone just giving a biography on the life of Christ and trying to explain to everyone that He is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Matthew's perspective is slightly different. He definitely has a Jewish audience in, in mind as he's writing, and he wants Israel, the Jews, to know that Jesus satisfies the Old Testament verses in the Old Testament prophecies, and He is Israel's Savior. So, he's writing more like a reporter. Now, that doesn't limit Jesus to saving only Israel because we know the New Testament teaches if you have accepted Jesus Christ, then you are of the house of Israel. You are a son of Abraham if you've accepted Jesus Christ. So, it's not to limit it, but it was especially directed towards Israel in, in, in the fact that Jesus satisfied the pattern and prophecy of the Messiah. Luke is different. Luke is a Gentile writing to a Gentile, and it's a singular letter. It's not written to a group. It's written to a gentleman by the name of Theophilus, all right? And he's writing a very intimate, personal letter, which seems to have this tone of not only is Jesus the Savior, and not only is he Israel's Savior, but he's your personal Savior, okay? He is your personal Lord and Savior, and he writes it, uh, some would say, more as a historian. But John is different. John is different. John generally is, is, is understood to have written his gospel last. He was definitely aware of at least Matthew and Mark's gospels when he wrote John. And there's reasons that we, we, we believe that, um, that he was aware of the previous two gospels, whether he knew of Luke's or not, um, don't know. But he seems to have a very different mindset. And, and the way that I just write it is he's trying to explain that Jesus is more. He's more than anything you can ever dream of. And the more you think you have satisfied or settled in your mind who Jesus is, then you delve in a little deeper and you find out that He's even more. And so he writes it from more of a theological. Now, again, this is not to set any of these as being better or more. We need them all. We need them all. But just understanding a little bit of the purpose of John's letter and John's gospel can help us as we study it. John is definitely trying to raise up an extremely high and deep and wide understanding of who Jesus is. He's more than the son of Abraham. He's even more than the son of Adam. He is from eternity beyond. He is the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is more. So when we started this, we started in John 1, and here you have a lot of different names and identifiers and titles given for Jesus, culminating in Jesus meeting Nathaniel, and Nathaniel saying, truly you are the King of Israel, truly you are the Son of God. And Jesus says, but I'm more. 
I'm also that ladder. I am that connecting bridge between heaven and earth, and that you will see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I'm more than just the Son of God. I'm the Son of Man. I am the link. Sin has separated us from heaven. Sin has broken the, the, the bridge between our relationship, and I am both the Son of God and the Son of Man. And then I uh, took a little hiatus for Mother's Day weekend to talk about the unique story and relationship between Jesus and His mother. But it's still in that same uh, mindset of Jesus being more. Mary understood her son is more than just a carpenter. He's more than just a rabbi or a good man. Although he'd done no miracles in his life up until that point, Jesus, or excuse me, Mary knew, my son can do it. My son can do more than what appears on the outside. And so she gives the instruction, whatever he says to you, do it. So again, this theme of Jesus being more, Jesus growing, Jesus being of greater uh, uh, importance uh, continues to permeate John. Then you have John chapter 3, and you have perhaps the 21 most important verses in all the Bible. That's Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Uh, that Those passages, those verses packed into there is more clarity, more definition, more beauty of the role of the Messiah. And then, of course, we have John 3.16 there, right? But also John 3.17, John 3.19. Oh, the, the, this entire pericope is just filled with solid, important data on the beauty of Jesus. And, and, and I was tempted, in, as I'm going through this, to really delve into each of these realities in John chapter 3 in the conversation with Nicodemus. But as I was thinking about it, I, I wanted to go a different direction. Sometimes in John chapter 3, because of the importance and beauty of that conversation with Nicodemus, it overshadows the other part of the chapter. And that's where I want to go with you this morning, is after the conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus, John gives us the last testimony of John the Baptist. And that's what I want to read with you today. That's what I want to spend a few moments studying with you this morning, all on this idea of who do you think Jesus is? And how can we understand through the gospel of John that he's so much more? He's more. Who do you think Jesus is? So I'm going to be reading. You can grab your Bibles if you want. John chapter 3, it begins in verse 22. Right after this extraordinarily intimate and powerful conversation with Jesus saying to Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel, you don't, yet you don't understand these things. The wind blows where it wants. You don't see it, but you hear it, and therefore you know of its existence. And, and he goes through all of these beautiful explanations of the role of the, of the Messiah. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light. That word light should be capitalized in your Bible or at least identify that Jesus is referring to a person when he says the light. John makes that clear in his gospel. He who practices the truth comes to the light as is found in Jesus Christ so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And from that point, John the apostle shifts the story to John the Baptist, the last testimony of John the Baptist. So, reading now from John 3, verse 22. After these things, after the story of Mary and, and the water turning to wine, after the conversation with Nicodemus, after these things, Jesus and His disciples came into the land of Judea, and there He was baptizing them, uh, spending time with them and baptizing, excuse me. John the Baptist was also baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there, and people were coming and being baptized. John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. Now, the Jews were obsessed with purification, ritual purification. As a matter of fact, physical purification was not as much a priority. When you understand what they were doing for ritual purification, uh, the physical was actually quite uh, uh, disconcerting. But they were obsessed with ritual purification. 
Now, the Jew they're talking about is probably some official Jew or some Jewish authority that was questioning them, saying, why is it that you, John, you and your disciples, you're baptizing over here, but this other guy, Jesus, is doing another ritual cleansing, purification, baptism over here? And they came to John. This is the disciples of John the Baptist. They came to him and they said, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you've testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So this is a very simple reality. The church of Jesus was growing faster than the church of John the Baptist. That's all this really is. The movement of John was starting to decline and the movement of Jesus Christ was growing. And the disciples of John didn't like it. They were saying, what's wrong with our purification? What's wrong with our baptism? Why is it that more are going to Christ? Why is it there are more that are going to this carpenter, this other rabbi? We understand you said nice things about him, John. We appreciate that you pointed him out as a good guy. But why are more going to him, and why is our ministry declining? What's wrong with our purification? And John does, as it happens often in the Bible, he answers indirectly. By the way, I hate it when people do this to me. Um, have you ever tried to buy a car? Oh, yeah, I like this car. How much is it? Well, how much can you afford? No, no, I'm asking, what, what are you charging for the car? Well, let's sit down and talk about it. It's probably not as much as you think. Would you just answer the question? This happens in restaurants as well, you know. You know, how are your tacos at this restaurant? Well, they're better than you think. What, what, what does that mean? Indirect answering. But John, and, and this happens a lot in the Bible, uh, I'm more of a direct person. This is a more indirect. They say, why is he baptizing and why are more coming to them? Verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. But this was really John's way of saying, look, if his ministry is increasing and I've already pointed to him as, as the Lamb of God, then whatever he's doing is of God. Don't worry about it. God is arranging this. Don't look at it through earthly temporal eyes. Look at it through the eyes of heaven. If he is growing and his ministry is growing because it has been given in from heaven. You, are, you yourselves are witnesses that I have said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent ahead of him. And then he mentions this uh, idea that was very uh, clear in the Jewish mind. They saw themselves as the bride and the, the Messiah would be the groom. He said, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. So this is way, John's way of saying, look, I'm not the groom. I'm not the Messiah. I'm the friend of the groom. I'm excited that the, the groom has finally come. We've been waiting for this consummation. We've been waiting for this wedding. I've been waiting at the door, listening for the voice. I've heard the voice of the groom, and my joy has been made full. And then verse 30. Now, if John 3.16 is the most important verse ever spoken by Jesus Christ in the Bible... I would submit to you that John 3.30 <laughs> is maybe the most important verse spoken by a human. I really mean it. John 3 and verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase increase. Jesus is more. He must increase. He's the Messiah. It is Him who needs to be elevated. It's Him who needs to be raised up. He's the Savior, not me. If any part of my pride or my uh, notoriety takes away from Jesus, may it never be. I must decrease that Jesus would shine the brighter. He must increase, and I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. 
Now, the interesting thing here is that you've all heard the phrase, you know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. John was at the height of his power at this point. John mentions that. He hadn't been arrested yet. He was able to speak with power. He was telling Romans what to do with their lives. Remember in, in previous uh, uh, occurrences with John the Baptist, the tax collectors would come to him, Romans would come to him, and John was able to speak with authority. Collect no more than you should, and don't oppress the poor, and do the, the righteous acts of Abraham. He could speak with authority. He was at the very height of his influence, the height of his authority at this moment. He had not yet spoken out against Herod and gotten arrested, all right? And before that time, right now, as, as these two ministries are, are both, be, you know, going up and down, John says, look, though I am at the height, I realize it's time for my ministry to fade so that the ministry and the work and the power of Jesus Christ can take its full effect. I'm telling you, that was not something that he conjured up all on his own. That was because he was speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was willing to set aside power. He was willing to set aside fame and all the potential that came with it because he understood his role, his role as the friend of the bridegroom, his role as the forerunner of Christ, his role as the herald. Behold the Lamb of God. May all go to Him. He who comes from above is above all. He is above all. He who comes from the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. But he who comes from above is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. But he who has received his testimony has set his seal on this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This is called the last testimony of John because these are the last recorded words that we have of John the Baptist. Okay, later on when he's in prison, he will send a message to Jesus okay, and his disciples will speak on his behalf, okay, but these are the last recorded words of John the Baptist, and these are words that elevate and, and lift up Christ as the only focus that we should have and not being worried about the things of this earth. I want you to notice three statements that he makes in this passage that I think are instructive and relevant for us today, okay? First of all, he says, this joy of mine has been made full. How many of you could have a little bit more joy in your life? Are you perfectly happy all day long? Yeah? Uh, we all could, could experience and, and uh, 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 appreciate having greater, deeper sense of satisfaction and joy in our life. And John, in his last testimony, says, the way I have found the height of joy is when I hear the voice of God as the friend of the bridegroom, when I hear his voice and I get to have the ability of announcing the bridegroom has come. When I hear the word of God, when I hear His voice, what is the voice of God? What is the Word of God? The Word of God is that which creates worlds, right? Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. What did the Word do in Genesis? It created everything. It raised mountains. It lifted up plants and animals out of the earth. It raises the dead. Jesus used His words to call people back to life. It cleansed people. There is no greater joy, church, than hearing God's voice. And every single day, God is not silent. God is speaking to us. He speaks to us through Scripture. He speaks to us through nature. But He even speaks to us through a sermon every now and then, by God's grace. <laughs> what opportunity we have every single day. There are a lot of voices out there, guys. There are voices in politics. 
There are voices in sports. There's voices in Hollywood. They have their place. They have a time to appreciate what they're trying to say and whether we should apply it to our lives or not. But John says his greatest joy is knowing the voice of the true God. I really think that we would experience more joy in our life if we turn down some of these other voices and turn up the volume on hearing God's voice. The last testimony of John. This joy of mine has been made full because I've heard the voice of the groom. I've heard the voice of Jesus, and it's a powerful voice. It does everything necessary for life. Secondly, that verse in verse 30, again, if if, if I was into tattoos, I'd put it on my arm or something. (laughs) He must increase, but I must decrease. This is salvation. This is the gospel. Understanding our need of Jesus, surrendering self, putting our own ego on our own priorities on the back burner and say, that's not what it's about. My whole existence is lifting up Jesus Christ and pointing others to him. He must increase, but I must decrease. If Jesus is not central in your life, if Jesus is not the priority in your life and and making sure not only that you're hearing His voice and being filled with His joy, but then using that and translating that throughout many ways in your life of saying, do you know Jesus? He's the only one that matters. He must increase, but I must decrease. And then lastly, He is, what is it? He's above all. He's above all. Now, I know we sing it, we say it, we read it, we think it, we believe it, but we can't truly understand it, that Jesus is above all, unless the first two realities are first in place. Hearing His voice, recognizing His message, being changed by His Word, being crafted and molded into His character through hearing His voice and His Word and the Scriptures, and then humbling ourselves based upon that Word and lifting Jesus Christ up Only through those two experiences can we really understand and appreciate what it means that Jesus is truly above all. He's above all. He's above politics. He's above protest. He's above theology. He's above religion. He is above all. And all those things have their place. Don't think I'm being derogative but they have to be seen as a shadow underneath the reality of God being above all. Now, I could take a lot of time on each of these, but I wanted to just share these in brief because I don't know if you've noticed anything on these three ideas that John shares with us. These are the last words of counsel from John the Baptist recorded by John the Apostle. And John the Apostle wrote another book of the Bible. He wrote Revelation as well. And I would submit to you that John's last testimony that we just read there in John chapter 3 is compatible and synonymous with our testimony in the last days called the three angels' message. Look with me, if you will, in John 14. John 14 and verse 6. Same writer, John the Apostle, same guy. And I saw another angel flying in the mid heaven, having an eternal gospel. Now, what does gospel mean? Good news. It's the good news. It is the joy that everyone needs to hear and accept and appreciate. It's the fullness of the reality of who God is. It is the eternal joy that we should experience when we listen to His voice. 
He has the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give Him glory. What is that? That is, He must increase and I must decrease. Fear God and give Him glory. This is the testimony. Fear God and give Him glory. The last message in the uh, in the book of Revelation, and, and our message today is the same as it was for John the Baptist. Our joy is made full when we hear the message of Jesus Christ, when we know the gospel, and when we share the gospel, and when we put Jesus first in our lives, when we fear God and give glory to Him. And then the last part, worship Him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the spring of water. What is that? That is putting Him Above all, above all, Jesus is more than anything else we can experience. And the more we get close to Him, the more we listen to His voice, the more we're transformed by His Word, the more we allow ourselves to be humbled and we lift up His character, we lift up His glory the more we will see ourselves in the context of Him being above all things. And we will not worry, nor will we grow concerned when the things of this earth grow dark. A football player has got himself in a lot of trouble here recently. He's a Catholic, part of the Kansas City's chief organization. He went to a Catholic college and from his Catholic faith, made Catholic statements. And his whole world has now been turned upside down because there's a lot of people in this country that don't like it. Now, I'm not Catholic. I don't agree with a lot of things the Catholics say. I don't necessarily agree with everything he said. But he was a Catholic saying Catholic things to a group of Catholics. How long do you think it's going to be until a Baptist saying Baptist things to a Baptist congregation is going to get in trouble? How long do you think it's going to be until an Adventist saying Adventist things to an Adventist congregation will not be acceptable even to those outside the church? Do you see where I'm going with this? The world is changing, friends. The world is changing. The things we used to be able to depend on, the things that we used to say, this is America, the land of the free and the home of the brave is changing. And until we see Christ as above all, as to, until we put ourselves as less and Christ as more, and until we experience the fullness of the joy of knowing that we hear His voice, we will be stunted. We will be impotent. We will be limited. We need the testimony of John in our lives today. We need the three angels' message alive in our hearts today. Or else we will be silenced. We will be persecuted. And we won't know where our foundation really is. Do you love Jesus, church? Do you believe that he's coming soon? Do you believe that we have a message? We have a testimony. Who do you think Jesus is? He's your Savior. He's also our Lord. He's our Redeemer, our friend. He is above all. He will sustain us, and he's coming soon. with our experience.
experienced yesterday. Help us to want.